A few days ago, I suggested some themes to watch for as you study African art. Now that you've made and listened to presentations, I want to return to some of these works and practice one of the trickier skills you'll need on the AP exam and on the Unit 5 exam, writing an attribution essay. Every AP art history exam has one short essay, that is one 15-minute essay, that asks a question like this one, which showed up in 2016. Before I show you the images that came with the question, let's look more closely at the question itself. The two key challenges from the start are, one, to figure out which of your required works is similar to the image you're given, and two, to remember which culture produced that work. Sometimes, by the way, you'll be asked to identify an artist or an architect rather than a culture. This is more likely to happen when the College Board chooses a Western work by a well-known artist. So, for example, this was the image on the 2008 attribution question from the old curriculum. Who's the artist? What is our required work? Think back to what you did over the summer. You should get so lucky, right? But you probably won't. Since the new curriculum started up with the 2016 test, for two years the attribution questions required students to identify a culture. Last year's test featured an architect. Back to the 2016 question. Here's the first image our students got, and here's the second. What is the required work, and what is the culture? You all got this one, I'll bet. Note that the scoring guidelines, which I've put here, also cut students some slack, at least when it came to identifying the culture. Graders accepted ancient Rome or Roman as culture ID, as well as imperial Roman, which is what the College Board identifies as the culture. I don't actually know how much leeway the graders gave on dates, because that information wasn't in the scoring guideline. There were tougher elements to the question, by the way. Students had to explain how the construction materials and building techniques accommodated the form or function of these structures. Students could talk about arches, about concrete, about multiple entrances, about the valerium. There were lots of choices. So ancient Rome wasn't that bad, right? They wouldn't throw you a work from one of those African or Pacific cultures with a long, hard name, would they? Yeah, they would. That's what puts the E in ECB. And that's what we're going to practice today with some of our African works. One of the attributable works you'll see in this podcast will show up on your unit exam. So you should take some notes. This is a work now displayed in the Seattle Art Museum. Which required work does it resemble? And which culture created that work? So here are the two works side by side. Remember, on an exam, you only get an image of the non-required work. You have to conjure up a mental picture of the required work from memory. But note that the attribution work will give you a lot of help. So what formal similarities do you see? And remember, your eyes are your friend. Well, we see hierarchical scale. The king is much bigger than everyone else and richly adorned in coral bead jewelry. In both works, two attendants protect the obus head with raised shields. The figures are frontal, with wide, almond-shaped eyes and a straight, flattened nose. Smaller figures appear in the upper corners. Both works show evidence of trade with Portugal. The brass ingots to make these cast brass shields came from Portugal, as did the coral beads around the obus neck. We clearly see a Portuguese soldier to the right of the second oba in our attribution work. Just a side note, the oba plaques are cast brass, not cast bronze. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. Bronze is an alloy consisting mainly of copper, combined most often with tin, but sometimes with other metals. Brass has a lower boiling point and is more malleable. That means it's easier to shape. Bronze is harder, but it's also more brittle. The brass needed to make the plaques was usually transported in the form of large bracelets, manilas in Portuguese, and the quantities involved are staggering. In 1548, just one German merchant house agreed to provide Portugal with 432 tons of brass manilas for the West African market. That gives you some cultural context. What else do you remember about these works, How why these works were created, and what messages they sent?
Well, it's a king, so it's probably about power and authority, right? These plaques were cast during the 16th and 17th centuries and displayed in chronological order across the facade of the royal palace, and therefore they served as the historical record of the Oba kings, of the Benin kings, the Oba. The plaques also offer a window into life in the Benin court shortly after Europe's first contact with West Africa. Portuguese traders sold Benin brass, as I mentioned, used to make these plaques, along with guns and the coral beads hanging around the king's neck. The Oba, or king, controlled the return trade in slaves, ivory, and other important goods, so that all the profit went to support his court and government. Here's an interesting observation from a BBC program about these plaques. They are not only supreme sculptures, but they are a reminder that in the 16th century, Europe and Africa were able to deal with each other on equal terms. As we'll see, this is a contrast with art from the Americas during the same period. Of course, relations did not remain equal. Do you remember from my first lecture how a British raid destroyed hundreds of years of history by pulling these plaques off the wall of the Obus Palace and piling them in a disordered heap? So, how about these works? You only get one attribution work, by the way, although you might get different views as you do with the work on the left. I just threw in another example for fun. So, which required work is similar and this is hard? Which culture does it represent? Yes, Ndope, and probably even portrait figure would be good enough, but Ndope is not exactly easy to remember. Neither is Cuba peoples. Note that just saying a culture from the Congo might not be good enough. I'm really not sure, because we have three other works from what today is the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. What do you remember about Ndopes, or portraits of leading figures, usually kings? Well, like the Benin plaques that we just saw, this carved image preserved history for people who did not yet have a written language. In the 16th century, the related ethnic groups that make up the Kuba peoples coalesced into a more unified kingdom under a single leader, or Niem. And like the Benin kings, the Kuba Niem employed artists whose main job was to record and glorify his reign. So here's an interesting similarity to some of our Egyptian works. Ndope were thought to be the site of the king's life force after death. More specifically, the Ndope supposedly housed the Nyims, or king's double, the counterpart of his soul. If something happened to the king, say he got wounded in battle, supposedly this wound would show up on his Ndope. Ndope were kept in the king's shrine. When the king was absent from the capital, the Ndope were rubbed with oil to preserve the essence of kingship at the center of the Kuba kingdom. So like many of our African works, this art had a performance element. Remember, the relationship between African and Pacific art and performance will be the subject of your long essay question. I just talked about context, content, and function. What, what similarities do you observe in form? The Ndope portrait figures are all made of heavy hardwood, carefully oiled. The figures are highly stylized. They're not really individual. The canons of proportion in this culture are quite strict. The head, signifying the king's wisdom, makes up a third of the statue. The figures have smooth, rounded features. They are frontal, that is, they always face front. The Ndopes have almond-shaped, usually closed eyes, a flat, wide nose, full, relaxed lips, and a calm, gentle expression. The figure sits cross-legged on a square platform incised with geometric patterns. I was interested to read that the king chooses his own patterns at his coronation. The right hand rests on one leg while the other holds a, now usually missing, ceremonial knife. The king wears a projecting royal headdress. Well, I'm going to stop there. You get the picture. A lot you can say. And in fact, you do get the picture of the attribution work. That is, if you can remember in dope, not easy. You can get visual evidence points by describing the dope you have on your exam. And you only need to make a couple of these points. All the more are always better. It's safer. One other important shared feature of Ndope statues, one that I think could easily show up on a multiple choice question, is that in addition to a distinguishing geometric pattern, each king chose an ebol or individual signifier. So the strategy board game depicted on our attribution work uh, is thought to symbolize the king's cleverness and skill at military strategy. The severed hand on a drum in our required work might mean that he's tough on his enemies. It might mean he has strength in his head as well as his hand. Maybe the student who presented on this work can tell us more. 
As for the Ebol on the third and dope statute, on the right, I couldn't find any information about what it means. What's important to remember is that Ndope statues, on the one hand, represent all Kuba kings, but on the other hand, each statue also represents an individual Kuba king, who is distinguished not by his facial features, but by his personal symbols. Okay, what about these two fellows? Which required work do they resemble, and which culture produced them? This is another figure from what today is the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Central Africa. I warned you, right? There wasn't a required contextual image for this work, but I found one anyway. So what do you remember about the function, content, and context of this very interesting work? Art museum websites are a great source of information for me and for you. The work on the left now lives at the Yale Art Gallery, and here's what the website says. An Inkisian Kondo is a specific type of power figure in which the spirit was activated by hammering a nail into the figure. At the request of a victim of the theft, for example, a nail would be driven into the wooden figure and the Inkisian Kondi would punish the thief. An Inkisian Kondi also worked as a deterrent, means it stopped bad things from happening. Important agreements could be sealed in front of the figure, which would then punish future violators. The mirror of the abdominal box and the whites of these figures' eyes refer to the ability of ritual specialists to pass between the worlds of the living and the dead through the watery intermediary divide. The work on the right is now at the Brooklyn Museum, although, alas, it wasn't on display during our last art history trip to New York. The Brooklyn Museum website tells us that an Kisian Kondi served as a container for potent ingredients, that was, that's what goes in that uh, pouch behind the mirror, and in judicial and healing context. To make an Kisian Kondi, a carver begins by sculpting a human or animal figure with a cavity in the abdomen. Then a ritual expert completes the work by placing ingredients with supernatural powers on the object and in the cavity provided. He activates the figure by breathing into the cavity and immediately seals it off with a mirror. Nails and blades are driven into the figure either to affirm an oath or to destroy an evil force. And I'm going to let you do this one on your own. What shared formal characteristics do you see? In plain language, how do they look similar? This one shouldn't be tough, but you'll want to think about how the Nkisi structure, materials, and design contributed to its content and function. So, which required work and culture do these masks resemble? Well, at least this isn't another work from the Congo. I think it's a little crazy to have students try to keep so many cultures straight, especially since the course can only feature a tiny fraction of Africa's many, many cultures. For what it's worth, I've suggested that the College Board substitute more than one work from a smaller number of cultures so that we would have some time to talk about the context in more depth. Depth. I'm not holding my breath. The Ivory Coast, by the way, Cote d'Ivoire, is in West Africa, not Central Africa. Uh, and Nigeria, where the Benin plaque is, is also in West Africa. So let's start with the easy stuff. What formal similarities do you see? Our required work is on the left. Well, these are idealized portraits, like the Indope. I don't think you could pick any of these people, usually women from a crowd, but we see a number of common features. High foreheads, arched brows, heavy-lidded, downcast eyes, narrow, elongated, triangular noses, small, open mouths, stylized, elongated faces, ornamental extensions that rise above the head, raised areas that indicate facial scarification. In many African cultures, uh, scars were applied uh, as a beauty mark or as a signifier of who this individual was. A textural and linear treatment of the hair, a very pattern. Once again, pictures are your friend. So, what do we know about the content of these masks? What did they mean? How were they experienced in their original context? In other words, what was their function? We actually know that the Umblo mask in the required course content depicts the dancer Moya Yanso. The mask was commissioned by her husband. It was danced for many decades, first by Moya Yanso's husband and then by her sons. In keeping with tradition, Moya Yanso accompanied the mask when it was danced until she was no longer physically able to do so, and then her granddaughter assumed that role. I think that's quite nice. But of course, we won't have that kind of information about an attributed work. 
What we do know is that in Blow Mask were an idealized portrait of a specific individual who was respected within the village where he or she lived. The physical characteristics of the mask are idealized, but they reflect the culture's idea of beauty. The work on the far right was auctioned by Sotheby's. Here's what their catalog says. Bowley portrait masks were worn to enact a series of characters who danced to music with a participatory audience. We have that performance element again. The performance climaxes with the arrival of the umblo in human form. The subject portrayed in and honored by a mask occasionally danced with it and addressed it affectionately as namesake or endoma. Okay, last one. Here are two works, each with two separate views. What required work does this resemble, and what culture produced it? Note, this is another work from what today is Nigeria in West Africa. The Benin uh, plaque is also from Nigeria, and in fact, we have three. The Akenga figure, uh, which I'm not talking about today, is also uh, a Nigerian figure. This is a Yoruba veranda post. So these are different cultures within the country that today is Nigeria. Again, I wouldn't assume that Nigeria is good enough for identification purposes. It might be. Even West Africa might be good enough. I wouldn't take the chance. The photo is not a required image, but I think it's helpful. Note that our required work is on the far right. This photograph was taken in 1943, before the veranda was disassembled and the veranda posts were scattered to museums around the world. So what formal characteristics do these works have in common? The attribution work on the left now resides in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So let's hear from another art museum website. This monumental work we've seen from the context picture that they were large was one of a series of carved architectural supports designed for the exterior courtyard of a Yoruba palace. It was commissioned by a king from the most renowned master sculptor in the history of Yoruba art, Olawe of Ise. Note how the posts are designed to show different figures in relationship to each other and also to show them interacting. They employ exaggerated proportions and hierarchical scale. In the case of our required work, the senior wife is much larger than the junior wife and is even larger than the king. This signifies her important role as his advisor. In the attribution work, the king's importance is demonstrated by his position on horseback. Note the careful attention to detail, especially in the carved headdresses. As your required reading observed, quote, the scale and boldness of Aloe's figures permitted him to carve elaborate hairstyles, to incise in intricate decorative patterning on the bodies, and to depict multiple strands of waist beads without diverting attention from the sculptural subject. And here is an analysis of the content and context function from a book on African art. Compared to his queen, the king is quite small. Seated on his throne, his feet dangle in midair. By adjusting the scale of his figures, Aloe, that's the artist, remember, evokes two concepts. I thought this was very interesting. The first is the power of a Yoruba king is not in his physical stature, but in the mystical powers that he derives from his royal ancestors. Those powers reside in the crown, which dominates the composition. The second concept Aloe evokes is the power of women. The imposing bird atop the crown concedes that the king relies on forces that women control. The large, physically imposing figure of the queen, painted a startling blue, also alludes to the supporting power of women. Although the power of the king is overt, that means obvious, that of women is hidden. The king and all creation rely on the energies that women command. Don't forget it, guys. Okay, I've run out of time, and that is more than enough confusing information for one day. So, as I said, one of the works that you've just seen will be the attribution work on your Unit 5 essay. Which one? Hate to say it, but it could be any of them, because I'm using the random question feature on Moodle. The elves inside Moodle get to decide where you land on the Wheel of Fortune. But you need to know about all of these works for your test anyway, right? So hang in there.